And this first session that we've designed for you is a fishbowl conversation. Or it, actually, it's a conversation in a fishbowl. Now, Antoine is getting the fishbowl set up, as you can see. Metaphorically speaking, this becomes a fishbowl. And what do you think we should put in the fishbowl? Fish, indeed. <laughs> They're not quite fish, but we have some uh, very uh, distinguished guests to join us into the fishbowl. So it invites those that have been asked to join the Fish 44, demystifying the future of work. And I'll explain how it works to everybody. Grab a seat, grab a mic. Thomas will soon introduce the guests that are here, but I'll explain how this works for us all. So if this is the fish bowl, and these are fish, we're missing one, I think, that I can see. Mumu, I think we're missing one fish that should be here. Then if that's the fish bowl, and they're the fish, then who are we? <laughs> Fishermen? <laughs> Providers? <laughs> they're fish. Or who said sharks? <laughs> the darkness comes out, Nicola. We had breakfast this morning. Yes, indeed. So the idea, the fish in here will have a conversation together. We're all participating because we're all able to listen exactly to what they're saying. All right? From the outside, we're not talking. But if you would like to talk, there is a way to do that. And that is you go to a fish, tap them gently on the shoulder, and the fish will pass you their mic and you will take their place. Okay? Clear enough? If you would like to join and there's a, too many people, make a cue and start tapping fishes. Now we're going to open with two fish that will begin this conversation. They are also able to be tapped out. All right? So if you feel that everyone else is participating and they're the ones least, tap them out to get involved. Or you can just sit here and enjoy the conversation. Okay? Now, Muriel, I think we are definitely... There we are. We have a very welcome fish. Yeah. <laughs> welcome in to join us. Um, there's three chairs free, which means if you would like to join as soon as we get started, jump in and take an empty place that is here already. Okay? Thomas, would you like to... I think we do have Jean-Philippe yeah. up, yeah. Our guests, Thomas, and then I'll kick away the fishbowl. Great, thank you. So future of work, right? Everybody talks about it. There's, everybody has an opinion, and everybody thinks they know what they're talking about. And you read the press, you read TEDx talks, you, you can spend 24-7 and still not be more smart around the future of work, right? And there, everybody thinks that this is the way it's going to be. There's the young generation, there's the next generation, uh, there's the old generation, there's contradictions, there's stereotyping. The, it's all over the place, right? So we thought, let's, let's spend a bit of time of trying to get under the skin and demystifying all those things which are out there. So we thought, well, whom can we bring in there to have uh, help us in the process, right? So we are very happy to uh, welcome Jasmine. Jasmine uh, is uh, the founder of an NGO called Youth Forever, which some of you around here know very well. It has started just about less than a year ago and has already a tremendous take up of a number of companies, Catri Agricole, Deloitte, L'Oreal, and many others. And the whole idea is to, to understand as to what is going on in this new generation. And how can we help them to fulfill their role in society and help them moving forward? Uh, they're doing a lot of studies with uh, um, the Boson Project, which is a co-foundation with Emmanuel Duez. So there's a lot of work. So it's, it's really serious research and serious thinking about what's going on in the head and in, in this changing society. And who is better than somebody coming from that age group, right? Without divulging the full age. Uh, but this is important, to have somebody who has the credibility in being one of them, if you say them. And then we have one of the others, which is Sebastian. <laughs> Olion, who uh, is a faculty here, is a program director of two of our programs, one uh, with RATP and, as, and one as with Danone, so very heavily involved in the faculty. He's a former investment banker, now he will tell you the story if he wants why he became an investment banker. 
uh, and he's also a consultant working with a number of big organizations. And also uh, a, a passionate sociologist, so David, passionate sociologist as well. Now we were supposed to have, and I'm and very thank you Sebastian in particular, we were supposed to have Francois Dupuy with us. And many of you who are here know Francois Dupuy, uh, who has been working with us for 46 years. Unfortunately, he's sick. He could not come up and he sends his big regrets. But we're fortunate to have Sebastian jumping in. I think all of us wish uh, Francois uh, a quick recovery if he sees on, on the live stream. We also have our fish then, so Jean-Philippe Courtois, as you know Jean-Philippe, right? He's a, a board member of, of Sedeb and the founder of Live for Good, uh, and has a small little side job as well with a small tiny company called Microsoft, and one of the senior executives and, and COMEX member of Microsoft. David, you already met this morning, and we have, of course, our wonderful new guest, Target, right? Coming in uh, fresh, um, from former ZGG, so we are very happy to have Gael with us. Um, and uh, we have our friend Thierry Bonetto, who has uh, now his own company on the future of leadership uh, and has been many years working with us as the head of leadership development of Danone. So we have a very nice group, and as uh, the rules go on, Peter will explain a bit how it works. Great. Thank you. Welcome and welcome to Fish. Um, remember, you're having a conversation together. You can forget about us on the outside, we're listening. So to get that kicked off, I get the real question here is um, how do we demystify the future of uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking for it. Can somebody tap on my shoulder so that I get out, please? Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, to make a long story short, um, I, I just have to add to what uh, uh, Thomas said that I, we actually worked with Francois Dupuy uh, for the last three years about uh, how the companies faced the COVID crisis, how they started to adapt. And I think to demystify what the future of work will be, just like Thomas was saying as well, we have to have a clear distinction between opinions and research. Because just as he said, you hear a lot of things about future of work, what is changing. Interesting. 90x percent of that are opinions. What we are trying to do are research. And to do research, you basically meet people. So what I'm going to say is a, a work we did with Francois based on roughly 800 interviews in 12 different companies. Uh, and about a third of the people we interviewed were actually young people who joined the companies for the last sometime two years, so they joined during the COVID, et cetera. So first thing would be, if you want to demystify the future of work, avoid opinions, look at research. What would you say? For sure. I think to start, we were thinking with Sebastian, maybe we'll tell you a bit more about how we started to work. So I started, I actually graduated in 2020. So if you remember, it was just after the first lockdown. Um, in a world where working didn't have a lot of sense to me, um, I was in an entrepreneurship master's, so very in the, the esprit of CEDEP. But the, the, even the fact of starting a company was really peculiar, really depressing in that world. And looking back on the impact of the pandemic, I think to talk about the future of work, obviously you talk about future leaders, future managers, future employees, some future freelancers maybe. Um, so this generation who's still in school today, graduating or graduating in the last couple of years, that's starting their professional careers. And if you look at them, and I can be an example and probably not a good one as I'm quite privileged I did HSC and probably not the best representative for my generation. But when you look at what is going on and the impact the pandemic has had on our generation, I think first of all is understanding the psychological, the academical, the financial impacts on the whole generation that we cannot sacrifice. So talking today about this, the future leaders, about the future of work, and we'll deep dive into that together. I think looking back into this very peculiar context with crisis coming from all over the place, some like the war in Ukraine, the, per the COVID pandemic, the climate change crisis has been kind of looming up next to us. So understanding how we start our journeys professionally, 
first not knowing at all how to navigate a world that we don't understand, but then also projecting ourselves into the future. So maybe I, I wanted to ask maybe all of you around the table, and especially Sebastian, because I know we're more than maybe 25 years apart. He could yeah, be my thanks dad. To, <laughs> thanks to L'Oreal, I, I look uh, much younger than, than I, <laughs> that I am. You are, I'm, yes. I'm turning 52 this year, so, so yeah, yeah. I, I could you, be your father. <laughs> <laughs> Future of work is quite subjective, as Sebastian said. It's all about opinions. So I'm sure that 25 years ago, the conversations about the future were already going on. So maybe let's go back in time. And yeah. Sebastian, can you let's share uh, how you entered Let's your take the DeLoreal and, and go back to 96 when I uh, graduated. When I was born. I know. <laughs> God. God. <laughs> Now I feel bad. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I, I will come back to what the L'Oreal people said before. When I joined, my, my first employer was General Electric in the US. And when you joined General Electric at that time, the first month was corporate tourism. You were not immediately working. You were just going to meet finance people, HR people, people working in the sales department, whatever you were doing. I was working in the financial services. And this means immediately creating a relationship without being immediately used to perform, do your task, whatever. And God knows that General Electric is a highly processed company, but you felt welcome and integrated. It does no longer exist. And when I, even I, my, my last thing before I, I turned to a consulting company, I have to say I was meant to be an honest investment banker and I was perverted by that guy, Dominique Jacquet, and by Francois Dupuis who told me you should do something, come to CEDEP, and I'd, I end up here. But when I was, for example, working at the Exco of a big bank, we were facing the subprime crisis. My job was to clean the mess. And I said we have something key, which is we need to welcome new people in the company, especially young people, to help us clean this mess and build the future. And I said a good thing would be to have them for one week creating a connection with others. What do you think the answer was? Oh, we don't have a budget. And they have to work straight, uh, straight away. And I said, but it's work creating a connection with people. So probably one of the biggest difference is about this way you're, you're getting integrated. But what do you think about this notion of future of work? And then I'll be really interested to know what our other fish yeah. are oh, interested in. But then for me, future of work is a bit of a rubbish word. It could be anything. So, and talking about the future of work, I know it's quite sexy, but I, when I was asked to come here today, I was like, what am I going to talk about? I have no idea what the future will be like. And I think the current times that we live in have only proved us right on that topic of uncertainty. But still, um, thinking about this talk, future of work for me is only looking at the present, basically, looking at what is going on today, maybe minoritarily, maybe what is going on in some parts of the world, in some companies, trying out new organizations of work, new tools, new processes. And it's only a minority today, but it might become a general way of thinking tomorrow. When you look at working from home, for example, I'm sh you, you all know that a lot of companies, maybe a minority for sure, were already practicing work from home policies before the pandemic hit. And then an, a, an exterior event kind of forced it upon everyone else. And it's not the reason why it's staying today. Basically, if companies have decided, in my opinion, and I'll be really interested to know about what corporates around the table think of this, but it's not because it's pra more practical that we continued work from home policies. It's not because we couldn't go back, but also because there's advantages to that. It's not only cost killing, but it's also having more flexibility, more autonomy. So looking at future of work, maybe for me, is a lot more being attentive to what is going on every day in our, in our social circles, in our ecosystems, understanding what is going on and not at all what is going to happen. And maybe an invitation to all of you to open your minds, to be more imaginative, um, use fiction to kind of draw these lines of what the, could the future be. Maybe the future would only be in two years, five years, 50 years, if we, we look at the 100th year of CIBEP. 
but also understanding that it's not only being creative, but also being bold. Bold to try things every day, to kind of imagine the future, but if you don't try it out today, well, we can't really talk about future of work. So that would be my input on this topic. Um, and we're really, really interested in what all of you think about, can we actually talk about future of work and what do you understand with this topic? My other fish. <laughs> what would you say? Can I build on that? Yes, for sure. Um, I think one way to demystify the future is to create it. Uh, to, to, sorry? Uh, to build on what you said. And um, I think it's a story that David, you mentioned before around L'Oréal uh, 50 years ago, saying um, we have a challenge <laughs> around executive education for uh, managers at L'Oréal and, and other companies. And how can be creative uh, to, to do so? Uh, and then you try something. Um, well, and give and us an example. Yeah, exactly. You try? Exactly. And, and, and I think that often we try to think about what the future might be as if it was already here. But it's not. Uh, it's us, we create it. And, um, Something that I, just a, a comment what I, uh, what inspired me one, one day, uh, I'm a fan of uh, movies. <laughs> and uh, you, so maybe some of you have seen the, the movie uh, by uh, Xavier Dolan, which is called The Mummy. And when he got the jury prize in Cannes, I think it was 2014 or 16, he said uh, in his, uh, what he said, uh, not only politician or economists can change the world, artists, we also can change the world. Everything is possible for those who dream, dare, work out, and never quit. And my thinking is that um, we need to have this vision and decide what we want to do. I take one example for me, which is a question in the future of work, which is digital and uh, artificial intelligence. And there are many people who uh, think about what will AI be in the future and how will it impact jobs and our self. And there is, I think, one course of thought that says maybe it will destroy jobs, maybe it will change a lot of jobs, maybe digital will take the human out of the job. And there is another course of thought which says maybe the intention of digital is to make the work more human <laughs> by offering to human beings jobs or ways of working that are, to take L'Oréal's point, worth them. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, for me, it's a key question in, in the future of work, but it's we as leaders who have to make this choice. And I think that it's not because it's possible, technically, that we should do it, we should do what we think is good. So it's come back to the vision of what kind of work do we want. And if you think that work is about people, what is the place that we want for people in the way we work? I, I don't know if I was too long, but. I know, Seb, that you have an opinion also on this topic, the future of work. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with what you said, but I think the the thing that has changed is this COVID crisis. Because basically, for example, take the, the usage of Microsoft products to do some digital meetings, etc. It was slowly going up in a lot of companies and suddenly everybody found themselves working remotely. And now, and demonstrated by the way, that they were able to run companies by self-organization, not respecting the process, getting engaged, etc., etc. And the reality of life is that you're perfectly right when you say leaders should do that and they could do that and they are looking at it. At the time being, you have a huge load of managers, my age, a bit younger, who absolutely don't know how to manage people in the new environment and especially young generations which have a connection to work and how to connect to others which is extremely different from the others, especially since they have demonstrated during the COVID crisis that they could work completely differently. That's the first thing. The second thing is that at the same time, the young people have expectations 
which are far different from what we imagined when I said opinion. When the COVID started crisis, they said, oh, it's very cool because the young people are going to love it and work remotely, and they will never show up at the office, and the old people won't adapt. And you see that the reality of life is exactly the contrary, because the young people realize they have to come to work, they have to connect, just like you were saying at L'Oreal, et cetera, whereas the senior people, they know the jobs, they have the connections in the company, they have the big house where they can work from. Because when you are a young guy living in 20 meters with a six-month baby, you prefer working at the office, actually. Uh, and so all this is creating a, a complexity. And I would say we must not say there is a present and a future, and it's two different things. Thinking about the future and it, anticipating things is also a way to connect to what is currently happening and making right choices to prepare the future for sure. But it's not just all about the leaders who are shaping the long-term future. It's about the current adaptation of a lot of people who are getting, especially people from your generation, the reference of what is working today in a completely different world. I'm happy to jump in, in the ball because I was asked to, to sit here. I'm sorry, we'll have to eat in 20 minutes, but I'd lo love to, 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 to jump on your remarks as well. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, actually, we should look into data and, and not just observation or, or opinions. And so l let me try to share with you some learnings we had across uh, Microsoft and work at this company. And so we had like 300 million people using Teams in their lives, and we've been studying a lot of that. <laughs> and the second part of observation as well is from manpower. I'm sitting at the board of manpower, which obviously is all about people. <laughs> anyway, people take jobs or don't take jobs anymore across the world, not just white colors like myself, but also blue colors. All those people that are missing in the airports, in hospitality, in hospitals, everywhere in the world, actually, not just in the US, but also in Europe. It seems to me, not just to me, to those data, there's a big shift happening uh, in right now <laughs> for, for the last few months and for the years to come, shifting the power from employers to employees. Okay, this is a reality. You see they everyone aware. It's not just about salaries increasing. It's about three main factors, I think, happening with the workforce in a big way. One is uh, flexibility. And flexibility can be defined in so different ways. <laughs> it's not just about generation millennials. It depends on the type of job you have. It depends on your culture, your background, where you live. You see it and you discuss with any kind of employers across the world today. Wow. Everyone, if they want to attract talents and keep them, they better work, rework, redefine, be creative about what flexibility is going to mean for that job. So accepting things that people are never able to accept before, like, okay, three days per week, or you know, half a day here and there, or doing this and that, working from home and working in the office as well. Yes, you can do that both as well. And defining criteria for that. So flexibility is a huge deal. And I think any of the employers who cannot be flexible enough to cope with the reality will have some big challenges. I think the second one, which is, is a huge one, is uh, purpose. There's actually some data point. It was a very interesting uh, study by Edelman about a year ago. And the second reason why people quit their jobs, not just, again, guys at the top of companies, but even guys at middle level and low level, 62% of them quit the jobs because they are not aligned anymore with the values of their companies. And they don't accept that anymore. So when they see behaviors of their companies, employers, uh, misleading people, you know, don't have the impact they should have from an environment standpoint or what they pretend to be. They just quit and they don't take it anymore. So I think it's a huge shift happening, particularly with new generations, but not only. And you see a lot of people leaving companies because they don't take it anymore. And I think the third one, which we, I think we briefly discussed a little bit, is I think there's just a time for and a need for a new type of leadership. I'm very biased myself, so some people who know me know that I'm uh, very passionate about uh, posi positive leadership, which is a school of, of food in terms of leadership, connected between positive psychology, neurosciences, mindfulness. But the reality, long story short, all people, whatever their generation is, really want to have a meaningful connection with the people they work with. So they, they need to have leaders, people who care for them, who have empathy, who actually can be... Uh, authentic as well in the way they live their work and their lives <laughs> and enable them to grow and give the opportunity to grow every single day. And I think that those 
at least based on my different bridge of observation, are big trends happening, mega trends, which I believe that most of us who are looking, seeking for talents, need to reflect on. Sorry. Uh, allow me a brief comment, because I think everything you said is perfectly right for talents. Because something we observed during a study are two additional things. The first thing you mentioned it is that there has always been a tension between the blue colors and the white colors. And it's actually a potentially increasing tension. Because just as you said, if you are a blue collar, if you are a 25 years old people joining an industry uh, to build uh, cars, your life is not extremely different from the, the way people were working 20 years ago, except on one thing. The top management, the way you're monitored, etc., can start to work in a different way. And the relationship, which was, as you said, very close, almost family-like in a lot of companies, is much more distorted and becomes fragmented. That's one point. And the second point is probably, and it's good to have Microsoft with us, is that a lot of managers think that the technology is going to solve the problems. Uh, if Francois Dupuy was here, hello Francois, if you see us, he would say, you never solve a human-based problem with technology. Technology can be used as part of the solution, but it can't solve the solution alone. And for example, you have a lot of people saying, yeah, if you can make connection with Teams, with the next generation, virtual reality, whatever, people are going to reconnect. But no, they are not going, they are going to exchange information, work together, uh, complete some task, but they will be missing something which is very important, which is what you mentioned, relationships. I actually want to pitch in, and of course there's two seats available, so if any other fish want to join, please do, uh, if you have any question or remarks. Um, you've been talking about the new generation and how their expectations and their relationship to work might transform the way that we handle things today. Um, just a quick, maybe, comment on that. I think it's all really important for all of you, especially working not only on white collar jobs, as we said, um, to understand that for this generation, there is a need to repair the consequences of the context before doing anything else. And you have to lead it at the same time as enabling new leaders, preparing them for handling really uncertain issues, being the new generation of leaders that we want to be, but understanding that Although we talk about freelancing, about new contracts, about autonomy, flexibility, about eco-anxiety, about climate change, about activism in every way, which is, of course, traits of this generation, but not for all of them. A lot of them are not in the system. A lot of them are just struggling to make ends meet, to find a job, and then we'll think about something else. A lot would, weren't able to leave their homes, their parents' homes, to kind of leave the nest, which has been forever a way to kind of be your own self, take your independence. And if they're not able to do this, just look at, I don't want to be depressing, but just look at the number of suicides in young people all over the world. I think it, in more than 100 countries, it's the first cause of death for young people. So there's a, a bit of responsibility in, for all of you first to kind of repair, and it's not only young people, of course, but repair their self-confidence, their skill set, because a lot of them feel that their schools have not prepared them for the challenges and the jobs that are going to exist tomorrow. That's how important CIDEP is in this context. Um, so first, just a quick comment, not to be depressing, but also it's an extraordinary opportunity to kind of forge a new world, a new status quo, based on sustainable um, performance, basically, and human interactions. And I got asked, I just want to share this with you and have your reaction. I got asked a few weeks ago to talk about next generation companies. That's a huge kind of other word, like future of work that people kind of enjoy. Um, and so reflecting on what could next gen companies be, well, for me, of course, first and foremost, it's for and with the new generation. Um, I'm, I haven't asked that question to Thomas, but looking into CEDEP programs, are there different age groups, for example? Are there those that started only two, three years ago? So diversity in every way, first of all. But then next gen companies, for me, is all about, as you said, for purpose, it's, it would be three things for me. The first one would be companies that address the issues 
of our times, more and more taking positions uh, in terms of social, environmental, politics even, as it is expected from their employees. So it's being able to address the challenges and being at the forefront of them. Then the second one would be some kind of alignment. Uh, you mentioned purpose, but for me alignment is also how to align our business models with our social cause how to align what's going on at the head of the company and at the basis, how to align um, every generation around the same purpose, the same mission. And I know it's complicated, but I feel like leaders and governance in general have a responsibility, a new role that's really complicated. And you said in L'Oréal at the beginning that it's also about having limits and being able to come back to yourself doing that. But for leaders, maybe an extraordinary opportunity to change the rules, to change the status quo and have fun. Um, it's not all bad, and I'm quite an optimistic person, so let's hope that the future will be for the better. And there, I would be interesting, as all of you handle everyday short-term and long-term issues, how you would encompass, how you would you define, I think, the future posture of leaders in the future of work. Um, I would like to jump on, on, on what you said and maybe add because you encourage uh, impact. So Thank you. what we could see more and more, it's okay, there is a search for purpose, but there is a search also for real big impact. And how it comes also, it's also meaning that we, are, we need to be able to create organization where uh, we really empower people, we give them freedom to act. And it's a bit tricky uh, in some organization because it's not the way we used to work. So create more space for this uh, and equip them uh, to be able to do it because a lot of people are not so comfortable to take this empowerment to, to be accountable. And I think the young generation really wants this uh, so I have a son of 18, I can tell you uh, uh, he doesn't project himself at all in uh, big, huge companies. He thinks it's not where I can have an impact on the society. He really wants to think differently. He is, as you said, connected, different way of uh, thinking, and he has a lot of friends like this. So the, the challenge for all of us is how we, can, we are able to create this environment where this young generation can feel they are aligned, they have purpose, and they make an impact with freedom to act. That means, as leader, we need to also be open to work differently and really encourage this, um, this freedom to act, be here really to support, grow them through powerful discussion, and let them do, mm. and trust them. And I think, uh, this, this will then help us to address the future of work because they are the future of work. And the um, future of work for me, when I was listening to you, was two things. There are fears, the crisis, uh, the planet, uh, AA. We don't know. You spoke about AA. I remember some discussion we had here in, in the past. A lot of fear and also a lot of opportunities. And if we are able to create this environment where young generation are able to speak, uh, co-create together, then we are able to do something very big mm -hmm. and very impactful for everybody. So, uh, but that's a big challenge that we have to create in our organization. So, just to follow up on that point. Um, we actually did the NGO that I work for and lead today. We started out um, with the Boson project that did a study for L'Oréal on the impact of the crisis on less than 25 year olds. And looking at the generations all across the world, um, and, and I want to point out, you were quite right that 18 year olds and 25 year olds are not the same today. And they are not the 30 year olds as well. So young people is a big cohort of really weird groups and from two years to another there could be huge differences so look into how your children are how your young employees are how your managers the first managers are probably they won't be the same at all and that's actually a big problem in a lot of organizations having this conversations between first line managers and juniors that kind of think they are alike but not really 
Um, just to come back on your, what you were saying, something that we observed that's really peculiar but quite uh, great news for all of you as companies is that from kind of a quest for meaning, which has been, I think, the human resources, boardship, and quest for meaning for everything of uh, fulfillment with work, etc. From this, that has been, I think, the fight of the millennials. So over the last 10 years about we want happiness through our work, we want fulfillment, we want purpose. From this, it kind of shifts when you look at the younger people from meaning to impact. So I'm, I completely agree and all the studies show it. It's almost forgetting myself as long as I can get up in the morning and I'm proud to do what I do. And then if it doesn't fulfill this purpose, I'm going to leave and that's fine. Um, so that's tricky to handle, but it's important to understand, I think, this shift from the quest for meaning and fulfillment to more of, I have to have an impact on the values and the, the topics that really I hold really dear. So completely agree on that. And again, don't put in the same uh, basket all of our youth, because depending on where you come from, depending on geographies and depending on age, it's probably really different, and I'm sure I'm not at all as my 18-year-old sister that spends her days on TikTok and doesn't understand what I'm telling her about work. So we could be the trait d'union, I'm not sure I have the English word for that, between all these generations. It's all going to be all together. I, I, I would be curious, Sebastian, also to know how we can use intergenerational, multi-generational relationships between leaders and juniors and everyone in between to kind of build this new status quo, because it's not going to be youth with this responsibility, but all together. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to challenge a bit some of the things that have been said. For sure. <laughs> that, when you do sociology of organization, you realize, and that's normal, that we tend to, to focus on what is the most visible thing. Highly educated people, talented people, I can leave the company if I don't agree with its values. Yes, it's b for example, if you work in IT where there is an I demand, you can do that. If you work for Tata Steel in India in a remote factory, you have absolutely no diploma and you have to go to the uh, industry at Tata Steel to basically get a rent to live, you don't have that relationship with your company. And we have to admit something which is very important, which is uh, a lot of the young people we meet in our studies when they tell you, I'm interested in the future of the company, you must hear, I'm interested in my future in the company. Mm -hmm. And even if the company is not the greenest of the world, on it, it's, well, I started there, which comes back to relationships, which is basically creating relationships is the way to create the glue, I think you mentioned that, and, 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 and to create the kind of connection people will have with the collective work. And obviously, I, I, I would say you, you all talked a, a lot about what is happening for talent, high educated people, just like Jean-Philippe who said, who have the power to, today, if you are an IT Slack developer, you can choose where you will work, for who, if you want to make 20% more, you just go to welcome to the jungle, and two days after, you are in another companies making 20% more. If you imagine that this is describing the majority of what is happening for the young people today, it's totally wrong. The reality of life for most of them, just as I said, is first, they go to big corporations just like people have been doing so for 50 years for protection. They want to have a safe working environment, some sort of a visibility on how the company is going to live in the future. And some of them will want autonomy because they want to grow. A lot of them want the exact opposite, huh, basically. They just want to have a stable working environment. They have been for two years in a crisis. Some of them are starting to build a family, maybe got a loan to get a house. They, and when you say be autonomous, some of them won't agree with that. And, and I, th I think it depends will. where they are in their life, too. Absolutely, so. absolutely. where they are in their life. That, that's why. So the, the, the most important thing is to keep in mind that the context where people are is very important, what the companies are doing is very important. And also, obviously, we are doing executive education, so we, are, we have a focus on people with talents who can become executive, and what we are describing is perfectly fine for these people. But let's not forget that a huge amount of them, that by the way leaders have to manage, are in a completely different picture. Actually, one of the things that we observe in our studies, and that's great news, and then I'm going to welcome our new fish, 
Um, what, one thing we observe is the kind of going back to companies in the terms of what I want as a young person starting my company, my career. Basically, the numbers are going up in terms of to have an impact because that would be the driver for a lot of them, not all, because you have to first kind of repair what is broken today. Um, to have an impact, I feel like corporations will give me the tools, the learning skills, the relationships, and also the broad impact. Of course, working for a big company, you won't have the same impact than starting your company on your own. In the, so you need all the, the different levers of, of involvement. But it seems there's a great news for all of you is that a lot of this generation believes in companies, believes in them to train them, to accompany them as they start this really weird world that we live in. It's always, in French, I, I would say, a condition que. So how do we build the conditions not to attract them, but also to retain, because obviously careers are not going to be the same in terms of lifespan. But some of them are ready to come in, in, your, in your bowels, basically, and change from the inside uh, business models to change uh, status quo. And that's great news for all of you, so seize the opportunity. Now, I'm going to introduce a new fish. I, if you want to share your definition and your input on the talk so far. Thank you. Um, I, I'm Dominic Turk. Some of you uh, know me around this table. Um, I'm a futurologist. That means I cannot work only on facts, because facts from the future are hard to gather. Um, and therefore, I work partially on opinions and partially on, on facts. Um, I wanted to join because somewhere this discussion is, again, going around what are the young people versus the older generations. I, I want to tell you something. I don't care at all about young people. Why? <laughs> because what is important is future generations, people who are not born yet. We are all speaking today the 2050 horizon. Okay? Well, most of managers of 2050 are not yet born. So wh what do we do for them? How do we manage the future? How do we reverse engineer the real constraints, facts, but we are going to have less resources, less energy, blah, blah, blah. How do we reverse engineer this into today's world of work and into tomorrow morning world of work? This is to me a real issue. And here, when we start to look at this very long term, which is actually starting tomorrow, issues, we think of things like, how are new technologies going to impact the way we will work in the future? Partially artificial intelligence, but one of my hobbies is, is, is biology, so biology will impact this a lot too. Um, how will we reverse engineer the ethics we will need in the future to the one we implement today? And here, we are far, far from having realized anything. And today, most board members are still evaluating the work of the company on a traditional accounting. We do not yet have an environmental accounting which is acceptable. But this is the only one which is important, environment accounting. How do we destroy the planet further? How do we leave the planet for the future? And here, generally, I'm optimistic. But today, I'm a little bit pessimistic. And I will tell you why, because it's a very personal experience. I'm probably one of the oldest in, the, in, the, in this room. And um, in 1972, we had a, 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 a magnificent report from the Club of Rome, okay? the Meadows report. What did my generation do with it? Nothing. Nothing. I've been, I've been a consultant with McKinsey for quite a number of years. I've been traveling like hell. I feel very ashamed today of all these travels I've been doing. But, you know, I was not... This is the, the tough part. I was aware of it because I knew the Meadows report. But I was not awakened to it. That's why I traveled like hell. Probably I, I can say, oh, yes, my employer wanted me to travel. Hold on. I didn't have the right word to tell my employer, no, I don't need to go to that meeting in New York because we could do that. We didn't have video, but we could do that by phone at least. And, and here the, the good point, I'm back to my optimism, is that the new generation, including you, thank you, um, are really starting to say, hey, hey, I don't want to go to New York for a meeting. Okay? So you start to say that we st because the awareness has entered into our world. So wh what this means for the future of our world, and I, I work and I will stop here, is we need to build in ethics in everything we do. Ethics meaning 
consistency with between my value, whoever I am, and the values the company is offering to me, um, ethics built in within any technology we put in place. And as you can see, for instance, artificial intelligence is a very good example. Many companies start to say, hey, hey, stop using my AI for face recognition for this or that operation because it's not ethical. And I think this is really where we have to go today to prepare the future of work for tomorrow. In practical terms, very practical, what I think is extremely important here is how do we go from boards and senior managers to anybody down into every type of job? And here, it's back to ethics and what do we take out of Earth for tomorrow's generation? For instance, um, it has very practical down-to-earth things. Um, we know by, that, by like 2035, um, engines like we have today for automobile will have to stop. That means a lot for a board, because the board thinks, oh my god, all these plants I have here and there, what do I do with plants? Stranded assets, as we say in English. Okay. Then but the real question for World of Work is, what do I do with people who work today in this plant? 2035 is not that far. How do we retrain them? Because in the meantime, I have to have this factory running. Okay, so how do you train them? How do you retrain them? How do we reorganize the whole work around this real and only constraints, which is environment? I will stop here. David, you didn't speak yet. No, no, not yet. I was listening deeply because, of course, it's very interesting. I need to say that uh, I'm not sure that L'Oreal has a, an articulated point of view of the future of work. I think there is no task force dedicated to it, although there are a lot of response. I would say. Uh, uh, of course, when I think about it, we have uh, an important commitment. There is a program, Young um, uh, Loyal for Youth, where we commit a lot to uh, make sure that the generation is not, uh, we say, damaged, etc. And a lot of work on sustainability, which is a quite of, uh, it's, it's a very uh, dramatic change at all. Typically, we were born in chemistry, and now we shift 100% to a green chemistry over the 10 lecture. But there are a lot of things. But I'm not sure that. Uh, but there are a lot of positive things happening. I just want to say something that, um, uh, coming to, to your point of view, Sébastien, is that uh, the, the, we, we may not have an articulated point of view on the future of work yet, but we are very, very clear about our identity and our business. So that's for real. So, and... Um, we know that the future of beauty is going to cre be created by people and by relationship and not by processes and structure, etc., etc. So because this is a, a, a métier which is very uh, sensitive, which requires a very deep understanding of people and not just people like you, but uh, people like in India, etc. Et so um, the thing is that we want to, st to keep the company like a, an organic model where the relationship are the core of it. So, of course, we, we adapt to the, and we, we try to find a way to augment uh, the relationship and work with the new technology, but to make sure that at the same time does not reduce. So, it is a fine line uh, to, to, to be found uh, here, and uh, we, we, we try to uh, put our leaders at work in order to we don't have enough research yet, but at least to listen more about what's going on at different level of the organization. Uh, so this is what uh, and the, uh, com the uh, group XCOM that will take place in July is going also to focus on that with uh, uh, workshops that are being led on the topic itself. So we are concerned. Um, we are deeply concerned about the fact that uh, uh, we don't want the commitment, the level of engagement to be lost uh, just by... Uh, you know, uh, having uh, um, uh, a, re a relationship that are becoming more distant, more disengaged, etc. So uh, there is, at the same time, uh, yes, we see the benefit of uh, not being the first client of Air France anymore, uh, because we were the first one. So that means uh, because of this relationship base, as you said, uh, Dominique, everybody was traveling everywhere for any reason. So, uh, uh, so of course, there is a benefit to reduce that also. So it's, uh, it's quite complex. I will say that uh, I'm not sure we need so much to, we, we, we need to seize what is starting. And I think L'Oréal needs to find its own way in this uh, turbulence. And, 
And if we are very strong to our identity and business, etc., we, we will find it. But what I, I am scared about when the, we talk about future of work, there is a kind of ideology that has been so much pushed over the two last year, which try to invent something which is not based on uh, anything, I will say, putting a lot of things together. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people at L'Oreal who are just, you know, uh, looking at benchmarks and saying, well, you know, you know, it is, uh, yeah, what we answer is that, well, you know what, we are L'Oreal, so we need to find our own way. For that will be uh, uh, my answer at this point, hopefully. Allow me a short comment and an anecdote. Two seconds. Uh, first thing, L'Oreal is very specific because what you are describing now, I remember somebody who joined L'Oreal told me if you arrive at L'Oreal and you are for an org chart and the description of your job, people will tell you you shouldn't work at L'Oreal. It's, it's always been a company in which the relationship, the way you shape things is very different. When I work in a bank, you arrive, you have your org chart, you have to comply, etc. And a second anecdote, allow me to say that. We did two years ago, just before the crisis to be precise, uh, we, we were involved, say, in a survey on the financial sector about how important it is for new employees the fact that you have to be green, eco-conscious, etc. Where do you think was the highest rating for saying, I have to work for a company which is absolutely eco-conscious in banks? It was in the traders under 30 trading oil. Okay? So let's not forget that when we do surveys, people tell you what they should be answering, not necessarily what they do. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. So um, I, I listened intently to what everyone was saying, very interesting. Um, what I'd just like to say is that uh, there are two points I'd like to make in a very concise way. The first one is that the world of tomorrow will be a world which will be much more China-centric and eventually Indian, in, uh, India-centric than it is today. So I, I'd like us to think about work in a Chinese context, uh, in a Chinese influence context. When I listen to L'Oréal, I always think about China. I think about COVID. I think about uh, the, uh, what could happen if the Chinese change their mind, their policies. Uh, they are not looking at work in the same way as we are. Uh, India is the same. I think we have to have a much more global perspective. And uh, I think the second point is a point of uh, uh, what work will do for society. I think we talked a lot about uh, startups, which is very important, but it's a minute part of what's actually going on in the world. And one of the big issues, as you mentioned, is obviously climate, but also social balance. And we must, we must think that work of tomorrow is something which is going to help find a much better social balance throughout the world, because there isn't one today. We have an issue. And so there are my two main points. Is, uh, what we do in a Chinese-centric world, China is moving a lot faster than we are. If you know L'Oréal very well, China is, is an absolute bomb. It's incredible what's going on on a daily basis. And at the same time, you've got top people in L'Oréal. I work a lot with L'Oréal in the retail division. And you, I've been interviewing people recently who've been in lockdown for seven weeks. And when I say lockdown, I mean complete and utter lockdown with their kids, you know. And uh, we're going to be influenced more and more by China. So we have to have a vision of the world which is not European and which is not generational, in my opinion. We have to look what's happening in China first and foremost, and uh, later it will be with India. But today, I, would, I threw this out to everyone, what's going to be the impact of China on the way we work? Well, um, thank you for bringing the topic up. Um, I'm actually Australian. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but I've worked in L'Oreal now for three years, uh, based out of Shanghai. Uh, and I must say that before I arrived in, in um, Shanghai, being more Western uh, brought up, um, I was so afraid to go to China, because it seemed like a foreign land. And when I arrived, I remember our, my L'Oreal colleagues said, you're fake Chinese, because you look Chinese, but you don't think Chinese. And the interesting thing was, in the last three years, I have been so um, amazed, because uh, some of the things that we hear about is often because we don't understand China. It seems negative. It really seems negative. But what I found in that first year in China, and I was traveling quite a bit because I could travel before <laughs> flying Air France and China Eastern uh, to you know APAC zone and, and comparing it. 
the technology was amazing. You know, we're, we've got 5G stations all the time, the, the speed of the Wi-Fi, except when you put a VPN, you know, slows things down, and I'm not supposed to say I have a VPN on my phone. Um, but the, 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 just the excitement also of the young people, they believe in the government. They, they've not had known poverty. I mean, if you come from the provinces and coming into the, into the promised land in the cities, and there are tier one, tier two, tier three cities, and tier two cities are more than 10 million people, so you can imagine the size of China, that they see that there's a promise for them to move in there. So even with, um, uh, with Xi Jinping, I mean, he, he has to fight some old guard who wants to go back to the old ways. And he's looking to the future of the young people and say, we need a land for the people who are in the future. So he goes and tours to, to all the provinces. And they've put in so much infrastructure um, to help uh, you know, people commute and, and get home and, and all that. So I haven't felt more communal than when I was in China. During the lockdown, I was there. I, I managed to leave um, because I miss my children in Australia. I haven't seen them for three years. But when I arrived in, um, uh, when, 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 when I was locked down, uh, some people couldn't cook. Some of the young people can't cook in, in the building. So when we received the packages from the government, those of us who could cook, we, we cooked and put them into the community lift. Uh, and we said, OK, just, just coming down, just press the lift and pick what you can. Uh, but these are stories that don't get told, that the community is so strong, and they still believe in the government generally. Now, Shanghai is a different story. Shanghai, the Shang Shanghainese were just as upset as the expats when Beijing came and centralized and closed everything down. So one of the key things is because they felt like they were special land, but now they realize that maybe they should also suffer like the rest of, of us. But suffering makes you become more conscious of what needs to be acted on. So I think they are now looking at a solution. Because of having uniformly experimented with what it was like for lockdown, my sense is they are starting to look at the, how do we create a, a place where economy can still go on, but we have to be strict with looking after the health of everyone. We've created a policy, and we'll try to innovate and be creative within it. So this is the, this is the mindset. And people are for the government. Um, we almost feel like there's more democracy in China. Uh, so having lived there now in two years of lockdown, I couldn't leave, was actually a good way. Maybe I'm indoctrinated, I'm not sure. But I, I, I still don't feel totally Chinese. I still don't understand, even though I'm Chinese. But I can understand the roots of how um, China, for me, has only conquered lands through economics. They've never gone and fought for things. I mean, they even put the Belt and Road to help other countries because in a way, I, I call it the loan shark mentality. I can lend you some money where you can't g give me back. I, I own the property. So if I put in railroads in there, <laughs> you can't pay me back. I own the property. But uh, it doesn't matter which dictator takes over. So there's a certain, like I said, almost an understanding of the bigger picture. So, uh, so this is the mindset. And I'm I'm interested to have any conversation with anyone because I, I'm fascinated if the world took on just maybe 10% of some of the more community efforts that's happening now. Yeah. Just, ah. sorry, Sebastian, just two oh. seconds on, on this because, um, you know, I, I, I look a lot at what's happening in China all the time uh, and with L'Oreal as well. But, you know, if we look at uh, Alibaba last year and the Singles Day, they were managing 580,000, 83,000 transactions per second. So as you say, in terms of infrastructure, I, I run a program at L'Ecole des Ponts in, in France on infrastructure. And China was responsible last year for 70% of global infrastructure, you know, in telecommunications, semiconductors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I really think that, you know, when we talk about work, uh, everything we say is, is relevant. But I think that the Chinese influence internationally will become much stronger than what it is today, and not just Chinese. I mean, we talk in L'Oreal a lot about Henan, which is a, a sort of a paradise for, for um, uh, the beauty business today. But you know, you're going to have a return where China will become a dominant feature yet again of travel retail and also of business in general. So that's what I'd like to say. Sorry, Sebastian. Uh, ju just one thing, because we talk about a, a lot of existing myth we have to demystify. Maybe a way to close would be to talk about underestimated or under-addressed 
real topics we have at present, because basically what you brought was that, was to say, hey, don't forget China is going to change, don't forget ethics is going to change. Uh, allow me to kick it. Oh, sorry, <laughs> but uh, can I finish first yeah. before you get me out? <laughs> okay. When I say, for example, uh, blue colors and white colors, I have a question for HR people around or everybody around. In the new world, the white colors, they work from home and are getting paid for their working time. What is going to happen with the blue colors who have to do the commute two hours per day? Are you going to say they are starting to work when they leave the house? Because basically they are going, doing the task to go to the industry, etc., or not? That's what we are, for example, observing in what we are doing now. A fun fish. That's okay. That's okay. You can stay there. I've got this. It was, there was no chair, so I had to tap. I, did, I hope I didn't tap too hard. I, I was thinking about um, the topic, the title of the topic, the future of work. And yet, we haven't really talked about work. We've talked about life. We've talked about people. We've talked about connections. And so I wonder whether... Actually, we have no idea. We don't know. I mean, three years ago, we didn't know there was going to be a pandemic. Two years ago, we may have guessed, or a year ago, we may have guessed there'd be a war in Ukraine. But we really don't know what's around the corner. And so, as opposed to thinking traditionally work processes, hierarchies, governance, all of those things, maybe we should just all turn our attention to what's the future of life? And what's the future? And uh, actually being in SEDEP, thinking about what the role that we could play is all organizations and any organizations. How do we help our future leaders and actually our current leaders manage this future of life that all generations, I mean, I, I love and we've done loads of research ourselves over the years, actually for 15 years we've been researching every person regardless of age or rank or blue collar, white collar and what comes out in terms of what they're driven by when they come to work, actually the biggest, the highest proportion of it is community. They come to work for a community, in other words, connection. They come to work to make a bit of money so that they can feed their families and whatever. It's not about career. It's not about career development. It's not even now, you know, the last one we did with the AGR, it's not about what's happening in the world. But yet it is, in a way, because it's about making sure that they are for whatever standing they have in, in society, it's about making sure that they're connected, they've got someone to talk to, is that kind of <coughs> mental health issue as well that's going on. So I just wonder whether we should start thinking about what's the future of helping existing leaders who also, I love what you said about, you know, restart and re just help people get back to feeling good. But middle managers, particularly CEOs of companies, I mean, I know some, you know, some CEOs of companies who are worried, really worried about their own health now. And, you know, this diverse group of people who want different things, and the majority of them actually just want to have a life as opposed to work. A work is becoming a means to an end. Anyway, I'll shut up. No, no thank you, because... I was always thinking I wouldn't have needed to get up because that was part of the point I was trying to make because we talk about the future of work but it's not going to happen in a vacuum. So I think as long as you don't talk about the future of life and society, it's, it's a very narrow corner. And so I was thinking about when we talked about the older, the more mature generation, like, <laughs> like my generation, maybe not wanting to go back to the office as much. Is it because I have the connections, because I have seen it, because I've seen all of the drama and all of the relationships that come with living in the office and I've kind of, yeah, yeah it's fine. But it's, sometimes it's for more practical reasons and most of the people in my age and my company, if they want to do work from home or more flexibility is because I need to take care of my dad. He's 80, he has a cancer treatment or, or something like that. Or I enjoy when, when does my daughter's school calls me and says, your daughter's not doing well, can you come and pick her up? And I say, yes. And one of the things I enjoyed most in the pandemic is I wasn't commuting. I got to have lunch with my daughter every day. 
And, and that made me think about, is the way we work, like, is the amount of work that families, and this is a European-centric point of view, it's, it's my experience, but that the family is providing to society, um, especially when we want equality, we don't want kind of the traditional type of marriage, one person stays home, but that means there's more family time, more relationship time that's been provided by families to companies like ours. So is that the only way? I mean, and there are discussions around universal basic income, and I don't, I mean, it's an interesting topic, but it's also when I think about my generation, why am I not doing more to support, like, the, the activism part? And, and maybe it's rationalizing it, but because my, my set of constraints with a job, with a responsible job, with family, taking care, there is a lot of hours. So would there be a different life for me, for anyone? That's not just like that strict separation, eight, 10 hours of work, and then is it a different way of organizing? Are there different ways of running businesses than, than companies? And probably there's much, many advantages to the way we organize things now because I've worked brought many advantages, but I think if you talk about the future of work, but you only think of the current context of what we do at work and how we work when we're at companies, I think we're missing a big part. If I can build on that, that was a perfect introduction to what I wanted to add. Um, I mean, the subject, the future of work, because there are several things all changing right now, which maybe is what's making this such a topic, the future of the kind of work that we do, the workforce, the workplace, or the lack of workplace. And um, I'd like to add into that the future of learning and how closely related the future of learning is to the future of work. And just to give a couple of examples of that, if we look at the massive trend, really just starting, but it's going to be huge on micro-credentials and alternative credentials, and how that could address one of the topics that has been raised here about what about people who are not accomplished learners and who are not privileged in the learning. Um, Singapore did a very interesting experiment, giving a micro-credential credit to every single citizen and you could not transfer this $500 into anything else so you had to use it if you were going to use it for learning and what they saw was the, 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 the building of confidence among people who had no credential at all that if they used this credit they actually maybe it was for a decorating or for baking or for something that was not so academic but taught them that they could learn and they could learn something new and so the, one transformation in learning bringing in micro and alternative credentials can be to give the opportunity to build confidence in learning uh, for people who haven't had that before but it also means that we need to think about what we're teaching um, accomplished learners and also people who are already in the workforce. With this, you know, the World Economic Forum says by 2025, I think, 50% of the workforce will need to be upskilled or reskilled in something that's relevant to their core function. I mean, it's a massive challenge. Um, but I think that students are going to start to get fed up of reading these lists of skills that come out each year, you know, the top 10 skills of this, you know, this year it's resilience, last year it was online, and, and next year it's going to be something else. Rather than just doing a checklist of what are the skills we need, what about thinking about what am I passionate about, what am I good at, where might I like to be? So what's the next piece in the jigsaw puzzle of my own skills that I need to fill? And then where am I going to find it? Is it online? Is it in university? Is it a micro-credential? Is it a, some experiential learning or some volunteering? And really helping young people deeply understand how to piece together their own jigsaw puzzle and actually helping some older people understand that as well, <laughs> because that's what's going to help us in the workforce. So I'll just finish there. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to you all. Yeah. Thank you. Bit of music, Antoine. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to you all. Yeah. Thank you. The, the, uh, the finishing fishes could stay for a second. The next um, item we have is the uh, start of celebration. We're going outside, we're having lunch. Um, it was a big...